And we've got a three, three, two, one. It's crazy. All this has happened in just 10 minutes. Still about 200 meters in the air, so... All right, let's kick things off with the moment that set the entire mission in motion. As the countdown hit zero, the callouts lit up the room. Booster landing, burn shutdown, liftoff, go super heavy, go starship. And here's the question everyone had. Would the vehicle rise cleanly? Telemetry answered instantly. Nominal power, nominal chamber pressure. Every system green across the board. 45 seconds into flight, another question hit us. Would all engines stay online? The answer came loud and clear. 33 out of 33 Raptors burning perfectly as Starship arced over the Gulf. Moments later, the rocket pushed through Max-Q, the point of maximum aerodynamic stress, and it didn't even flinch. That's how you open a mission. Now let's tackle one of the most fascinating and still misunderstood parts of Starship's flight profile, hot staging. So here's the question. How do you separate a rocket this massive without wasting precious momentum? The answer is hot staging, and Flight 11 showed us exactly how it works in real time. First, all but three of the Raptor engines on Super Heavy begin shutting down. Not all at once, but in carefully timed banks until only the three center engines remain running. Why keep those three burning? Because they stabilize the booster during the moment that comes next, the release of the clamps connecting ship to the hot stage adapter. And here's where things get exciting. While Super Heavy is still firing those three center engines, the ship immediately lights all six of its Raptors. No pause, no coast, no break. Six engines roar to life and push ship uphill, beginning its climb towards space. But what about the booster? This is the part most people miss. Almost instantly, Super Heavy reignites 12 of its 13 outer engines in a powerful boost back burn. That's 12 Raptors relighting just seconds after shutdown, pivoting the booster around and sending it back toward its planned splashdown zone in the Gulf. In less than a minute, we witness a perfectly choreographed dance of shutdowns, clamp release, ignition, and boost back a sequence only possible with precision-engineered timing. Hot staging isn't just clever, it's art in motion. So once hot staging is complete, the next big question becomes, can the booster pull off that complex boost-back sequence? And Flight 11 gave us a crystal-clear answer. Super Heavy fired up 13 engines to start the boost-back, carving a massive arc through the sky. Then, exactly as planned, those engines throttled down until only three were still burning to finalize the maneuver. Moments later, the boost back burn ended, and we watched the hot stage section drift away, beginning its own slow fall toward a splashdown in the gulf. That separation looked almost gentle, but it was incredibly precise engineering at work. Meanwhile, ship didn't miss a beat. With all six Raptors still firing, it powered upward accelerating towards space while the booster began its journey home. Now let's move into one of the most dramatic phases of the mission, Super Heavy's plunge back into the atmosphere. And the big question here is simple, can a rocket this massive really control itself during hypersonic re-entry? Flight 11 didn't just answer that question, it showcased the most stable return we've seen so far. As the booster arced downward toward the gulf, its four hypersonic grid fins snapped into action. These things aren't just metal flaps, they're aerodynamic steering blades working against insane air pressure. So the next question is, how much control can grid fins provide at these speeds? The answer, judging by the footage, is a lot. The booster held its trajectory cleanly, guiding itself like a guided arrow as it dropped into thicker layers of the atmosphere. With the splashdown zone approaching, tension in the control room rose. Because this wasn't just any landing burn, this was the version 3 landing sequence, the one meant to simulate future tower catches. And just listen to how complex this choreography is. First, the booster lights 13 engines at once. 13. That creates a massive deceleration pulse. Then, almost immediately, it downshifts to 5 engines, trimming speed with far more finesse. And finally, just before the booster reaches roughly 200 meters above the ocean surface, it drops again to three engines, 
the last breaking step before full shutdown. So here's the real question. Can all of that happen in perfect sequence at hypersonic re-entry with barely seconds to spare? Flight 11 proved it can. Every ignition, every throttle change, every shutdown hit exactly the right moment. And then came the call-out we were all hoping for. Booster landing burn shutdown. The room erupted, and honestly, it deserved that reaction. This wasn't just a landing burn. It was a demonstration of the landing architecture that future missions will depend on, especially the tower catch attempt on upcoming flights. Version 3's behavior matters because this is the precision SpaceX needs if Starship is ever going to be fully and rapidly reusable in the end. The booster didn't just splash down. It executed a Version 3-style landing burn so cleanly that even the commentators admitted they were jealous of the crowd that got to watch it live. Another huge win in the middle of an already packed mission. With the booster safely executing its Version 3 landing burn, all eyes shifted back to the ship because the next big milestone was Second Stage Engine Cutoff, or SECO. And here's the question. Would all six Raptors complete their ascent burn exactly as planned? The first sign came when the three vacuum Raptors, the RVACs, shut down one by one. That's intentional, because their job is efficiency at altitude. Then, just seconds later, the remaining three center Raptors powered down marking full SECO and confirming that Starship had hit every one of its in-space ascent objectives. No anomalies, no warnings, just clean execution from start to finish. And with that, a new question emerged. What happens next? The answer, one of the mission's most anticipated moments, the opening of the payload door. Starship was officially ready to begin payload operations, so now that Starship has completed SECO, the big question becomes, did the payload door, arguably one of the most delicate mechanisms on the entire vehicle, open cleanly? Because if you followed earlier test flights, you know how critical this step is for future missions. And sure enough, after a few seconds of suspense, the door cracked open and then swung fully into position. Smooth, controlled, almost effortless. Starship was ready to deploy its payload. But what exactly was it deploying today? This time, we weren't launching operational satellites. We were deploying dummy versions of the new Starlink version 3 units. These test satellites serve one purpose, to validate the deployment hardware, rails, mechanisms, and performance under real flight conditions. The moment the door opened, the first satellite glided outward, cleanly. No jolts, no sticking, no vibration. So here's the question. Why did it look so much smoother than the last flight? Because SpaceX made tweaks to the deployment rails based on earlier data, and those adjustments paid off. Every satellite moved like it was on a perfectly polished track. A few seconds later, the second one followed, then the third, then the fourth. One by one, Starship released them with the quiet confidence of a system that's getting ready for routine orbital payload missions. Each deployment took roughly a minute, and each one looked just as clean as the last. Now let's zoom out for a moment, because what these satellites represent is much bigger than just a flight test. Starlink version 3 is a massive leap forward. A single Starship launch will eventually add roughly 60 terabits per second of capacity to the global network. That is 20 times more throughput than a Falcon 9 launch can deliver today. And that raises the obvious question. How is Starlink even managing all this data? The answer is that Starship itself is now directly using Starlink for mission telemetry, video, and real-time downlink. This is where things get crazy. During re-entry, spacecraft typically lose signal because a plasma layer surrounds them, the blackout zone. But Starlink's frequencies are powerful enough to punch through that plasma giving engineers real-time telemetry even when older systems would have gone silent. Without Starlink, we would not be watching live footage from dozens of cameras across Earth or receiving video from Funboy stations all the way out in the Indian Ocean. And Starlink on the ground? It's exploding in scale. Over 7 million active customers across more than 150 countries and markets. New hardware rolling out. New factories in Texas global adoption accelerating, 
Starship and Starlink aren't just connected, they're driving each other forward. Now, one more important detail. Every satellite deployed on this mission is a non-orbital test unit. They share Starship's suborbital trajectory, and all of them will burn up harmlessly during re-entry. Their purpose isn't to operate, it's to validate the deployment system. And today, that system delivered flawlessly. Now, after the final dummy satellite drifted away, the next big question was simple. Could Starship close that massive payload door as cleanly as it opened it? Because remember, future missions depend on that mechanism working perfectly in both directions. And sure enough, slowly and steadily, the door slid back into place, sealing shut with no visible hesitation. A huge milestone checked off. With the door secured, Starship transitioned into its long coasting phase toward the Indian Ocean. This part of the mission is quieter, but it's critical. It tests how the vehicle handles. Extended flight, thermal environments, and guidance over thousands of kilometers. And right in the middle of that calm cruise, we saw a brief Raptor ignition and shutdown. A tiny blip, completely intentional, confirming engine responsiveness for later phases. And now we arrive at the moment every Starship viewer waits for, the fiery return. But before we dive in, the host gave us a reminder that set the tone, this re-entry would not be smooth. Why? Because SpaceX was intentionally pushing Starship to its limits, trying to discover exactly where those limits are. So here's the question. How does a vehicle this massive behave when it slams back into the atmosphere at hypersonic speed? The first clue came from the speed indicator. You could see the velocity drop faster and faster as the ship used Earth's thickening air as a giant brake pad. Then something immediately stood out. The skirt, the heat-exposed lower ring, was fully intact. In Flight 10, a chunk of that skirt tore away during entry, not this time. Version 3 engineering was already showing its improvements. As Starship crossed toward the Indian Ocean, it began its bank maneuver, a dramatic sideways tilt used to steer, scrub velocity, and align itself for the final descent. The horizon rotated, the plasma shimmered, and the entire vehicle shifted into landing posture. Then came the finale, the landing burn. Three Raptor engines lit, then throttled down to two, and finally shut off completely. Starship met the water with precision, completing a controlled splashdown just where engineers expected. No attempt to recover it. The goal was data, not hardware. And with that, the callout came through the loop. Welcome back to Earth, Starship. Another massive milestone added to the program, 